Okay, welcome again. Um, I'm going to start my slides now. Thank you um, to everyone for registering um, for this first introductory webinar for the RARE 2030 panel of experts. Um, we have uh, up to 90 some participants on our call, so I'm very um, pleased to see the enthusiasm, not only of those of you who have accepted to join um, on this very core consultative body for our project, but who have um, taken the time out of your day to hear this broad introduction, which will hopefully give you um, a first go at explaining why we're doing this project, why we're all excited about this project, um, and how each of your roles will be very uh, crucial to allowing us to come to our um, final outcomes, which are policy recommendations for the next um, 10 years and beyond for people living with rare diseases. Um, so I will begin just by introducing um, for you all of those who are on the call. Um, I myself, Anna Cole, am the um, project lead for this project, RARE 2030. I'm also public health policy advisor at Eurotis. Um, that's my current role, although I've um, worn a number of hats um, throughout the last decade. Um, but my, my core um, focus right now is on coordinating this project. I also have Victoria Headley from Newcastle University, um, who will be um, giving you the, the actual um, largest detail and probably largest portion of this um, presentation and the most critical part explaining to you how you'll be working as a very large uh, group of experts. We have uh, our colleagues from EC Nova, um, experts on the foresight process itself, Giovanna Giuffre and Svetlana coming from EC Nova. We have Charlotte Rodwell from Orphanet, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, the database for uh, rare diseases and uh, orphan drugs, who is also a critical uh, partner in our project. Um, and that's it. So I will begin with an overview um, of the project, starting with a nice presentation from Jan Lekam, our Chief Executive Officer, um, and then go over some of the general um, details of the, of the project uh, before we go into the specifics. I know we haven't got sound. Ah, thank you. Let me try again. I'm backing now for... Good afternoon, fellow experts, joining the panel of experts of the Foresight Rare 2030. I'm very pleased to welcome you for your first activity in this uh, panel. We are embarking now for a uh, two years uh, journey uh, to shape the next decade of policy on rare diseases. Obviously, we cannot predict the future, but we can prepare it. And sorry to say, that's the mission you have accepted uh, for this panel of experts. Rare 2030 is a unique opportunity to press the pause button of our busy lives as advocates, as scientists, as doctors, as policymakers in uh, rare diseases. And we put on the pause button because we want to think really deeply about what are the needs of people with rare diseases in Europe today and the next 10 years and how to address the challenges of people living with rare diseases in this new context. So the goal is to create a shared vision in order to move forward a new policy for the health and well-being of people living with rare diseases in Europe and beyond. We're going to go through four steps. The first step is you, the panel of experts, and you are a large group, a group which is composed of different stakeholders, of people from all over Europe and across uh, the different rare diseases. We even have some experts from beyond uh, Europe. In parallel, there is a knowledge base which is being prepared and you're going to work also from that knowledge base. And that takes us to the second step, which will be with you to identify 
the trends and drivers of change. You are the best place to tell us what do you see as the big parameters? What do you see as low signals? And that takes us to the third phase, which will be to develop and validate with you the scenarios of the future. So the what if that happened, then what will happen? What are the cascades in order to conceive how our future may look by 2040? And from that, we will select what's where we want to go, what's the best scenario for people living with rare disease and for society. And that's the how. And we will look at how to get there by 2030 and then to decline the different, to cascade the different policy options. The outcome of all this work will be to provide with the knowledge base, with the future scenario, and particularly with the policy recommendations and policy options to provide guidance for a well-informed policy shaping at the national level and European level. And we will use this foresight to prepare the next important phase uh, of rare disease policy in the European Union. And that includes a new context, a new European Parliament from which a new European Commission will derive. And as we know, there is already ongoing the preparation of the multi-annual financial framework of Europe. And that will happen at the same time, its implementation. So we need to prepare for that also. And not the least, a significant uh, legislative work under the next mandate with the full pharma review, but also other policies like HTA, uh, revision of the cross-border healthcare based on the report. So there will be different elements in addition to transversal policy on rare diseases. And where we would like to get with this uh, effort of the foresight is that maybe, maybe there is the basis for a new uh, commission communication, a new council recommendation, or at least clear policy recommendations to member states and to the EU uh, at large. Now the impact of your work and of the foresight, RE 2030, will be beyond Europe, it will be also international. I mentioned the experts from outside uh, Europe, but also the scenarios will inform discussion at the international level. Okay, it's only Europe, but still, we will integrate different elements. And at this moment, as there is policy development with the political declaration on universal health coverage in 2019, but that we are also taking all the steps necessary to go toward the UN resolution in the General Assembly uh, to address the challenges of people with rare diseases in the coming years, we will use also this work uh, on policy uh, options. So many countries are looking at us. You know that what has been done in Europe in the last 10 years, even 20 years, if I look at the first legislation on orphan drugs and then pediatric and advanced therapies, uh, but if we look at the last 10 years with the Commission communication on rare disease and Council recommendation on national plans, we've seen what we've done, right? And that has had a lot of impact in all Latin and Central America, in South Asia, in Australia, and many more countries. So what we're going to do in the next two years will have impact beyond. There is absolutely no doubt. And this is really a critical opportunity for people living with rare diseases to continue to uh, really promote what's needed to address the huge needs that are still non-addressed and to improve the health and well-being of 25 to 30 million people living in the European Union and in Europe beyond because we care about 48 countries uh, in Europe in the work and I'd like to thank you very much for accepting to take the challenge dedicate the time and bring the best of your knowledge and commitment to this effort thank you Okay, um, so I think um, a lot of the slides you'll find in my presentation will echo um, the major messages um, from Jan in that video, but I hope it serves as a source of inspiration um, and clarity for the work that we will um, be 
collaborating on together in the next two years. So a recap. RARE 2030 um, will be a two-year project. It was launched in January, at the end of January of 2019 and will continue on through the end of 2020. Um, it is a participatory project in which, as Jan mentioned, we ultimately look to provide recommendations on policies in the next 10 years that will affect um, our lives long beyond that. Um, and that major audience being, of course, um, policymakers at the European level, but also at the national and regional levels as well, as, a, as, uh, as well as a number of other stakeholders which will be looking um, towards us and these recommendations to best map out uh, their own respective activities. Now, the major steps in this project and the major objectives of this project, again, are to um, get a, a finger on the pulse really of where we are today, to given the experience and the successes that we've had to this point, uh, identify relevant drivers of change that will um, push forward our future in, in rare disease policy work, to try to anticipate how uh, those drivers will and uh, how will they'll influence um, our uh, the lives of people living with rare diseases um, and where we would like to prioritize certain drivers and or perhaps prioritize less others uh, given of course that there are many possible scenarios um, given um, what we prioritize or not and to finally uh, forge a consensus to be able to give a solid set of recommendations um, I think it will be important just to um, underscore the fact that this project comes at a very important uh, moment for uh, our community. Um, first of all, it comes at a time where we have the end of a few major rare disease policy platforms. So many of you uh, were members of the expert groups on rare diseases and heavily involved in the joint action on rare diseases, both of which have come to an end. Um, and so we are both privileged but very conscious of the fact that the messages coming out of this project are really um, a new um, channel of communication with policymakers on what we expect um, and anticipate to put to put forward as, pol as policies for people living with rare diseases. We also have the context, a uh, new political context. So of course, um, parliamentary elections coming up, which will then naturally influence a new commission. The same goes on the national level um, of new um, policymakers who will be um, stepping up either as new members or new to the rare disease community or not. We have a general surge of interest, of course, in investing in rare diseases in general um, and specifically in, in orphan drugs or other technologies that can um, improve diagnosis and treatment. We have um, a rapidly changing society in which case we have new technologies new opportunities but also new obstacles to confront um, in those same um, achievements and we have as always but perhaps more um, than ever um, competing interests and competing budgets um, for health um, in general but perhaps um, for other areas as well so just to recall um, the successes uh, that were already mentioned once in our community starting in 2008 and 9 with the uh, Commission Communication and Council recommendations that set forward a nice roadmap for member states to be able to best initiate um, activities to improve the lives of people living with rare diseases across uh, a number of channels of, of um, and approaches. We have the cross-border healthcare directive that it's being um, re-analyzed, um, if you will, in terms of its successes, but also perhaps its limitations in 2011. And we have the very, um, crucial framework of European reference networks, um, which are um, still sort of at its beginnings, but certainly um, demonstrating um, extreme success in improving the healthcare pathways that patients um, go through when trying to be diagnosed, cared, uh, and treated. Um, I just would like to draw your attention to the end um, of this timeline. So as mentioned in the video, uh, although we are looking ultimately to provide concrete policy recommendations through 
2030, and that goes in parallel with the ending of a number of strategies um, and funding instruments um, on the European level. Although we would like to um, contain our recommendations to 2030, as you'll hear throughout the presentations today, when doing um, a foresight exercise, which by the way is often used in, in many other industries, um, traditionally um, transportation, energy, where you really need to consider way beyond 10 years ahead um, to be able to envision some of the uh, obstacles or opportunities that you'll be confronted with. And so in our work, uh, we certainly encourage you to look beyond the next 10 years in considering um, what we might need to put uh, in place and identifying the trends that will influence that. As mentioned in the video, uh, rare diseases are certainly gaining traction on the international and global level. So I would just like to keep that in mind as we work through the next two years. Um, in terms of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we have a real opportunity um, as a European community and as a community of people living with, working in the field of, of, of rare diseases that can help contribute to achieving these goals. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, I think that we will certainly highlight them um, in our work. Uh, my colleagues who are working through the um, Rare Diseases International Initiative and um, more closely with the UN um, and NGO Committee on Rare Diseases at the, at the UN level um, are really going into great detail identifying the sustainable development goals where our community can have um, an additional impact uh, in guaranteeing that nobody is left behind in terms of access to care and treatments. Um, we also have a new um, group at the European level called the Steering Group on Health Promotion, Disease Prevention and Management of Non-Communicable Diseases. And rare diseases has been selected as a priority um, by this group, who's really also looking towards our work uh, to see how to best um, approach, invest and support um, our community in, in continuing to um, Promote, promote innovative practices for people living with, with rare diseases. And finally, the infrastructure of reference networks. So just to keep those in mind um, during the next um, two years as, as a context when we work. We mentioned um, the sustainable development goals, but we also have other initiatives such as the European Joint Program on Rare Diseases that will be going in parallel to Rare 2030. Um, and we, of course, have put in place a um, number of mechanisms um, to ensure that there's not overlap and that there's um, a good level of exchange between the initiatives done here and there. Um, and we've already mentioned the political context of the new um, parliament, commission, um, perhaps authorities at the national level, and ideally a UN resolution on, on rare diseases in the coming years. So although the um, ambition of this project is with you as experts um, to make sure that we're all aware of um, what has been done to date, how effective those activities um, are and identifying the areas for improvement, I think we can all agree um, that our main goal is to maintain rare diseases as a public health priority, um, certainly for um, health authorities, but other stakeholders uh, as well, and to specifically um, have the objective of always increasing the life expectancy um, and the quality of life of people living with rare diseases in Europe, to ensure uh, a rapid diagnosis, um, to best enable access to treatments, but to make sure that the um, care, both social and medical, is provided throughout the lifetime of a patient, that it's uh, centered on their needs, that it's multidisciplinary, and that it's evidence-based. Um, and finally, to make sure that people living with rare diseases are included um, in society in a meaningful way. So again, our goal in this work is will be to come up with the specific policy um, recommendations and policies that could uh, get us to this shared vision, um, but of course there are a number of possible ways to get there. 
I'd just like to draw your attention to the fact that when the European Commission gave um, the opportunity for this type of work, um, for which we were fortunate to uh, be selected as coordinators, um, they were very clear that um, the methodology that they would like to see um, is quite structured. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with the consultative uh, projects and initiatives that Yordis has um, either taken part in or led in the last few decades. Um, and certainly they were always constructive in our mind, but this time we use um, the innovative approach of, of foresight to do that. And I'll go into greater detail on the specific steps, but I'd like to draw your attention here to the fact that the commission very much underscored um, a desire that our recommendations um, take into consideration existing EU resources. So it's for that reason that I mentioned the new steering group on promotion and prevention, why I highlight the European reference networks um, as a major um, opportunity to put into practice some of the recommendations that we'll come up with, and to also bring your attention to the new virtual platform, the EU health policy platform, which will be another channel of um, both communicating our recommendations, best practices that we highlight and um, that we, that that we identify in our discussions um, and to um, allow maybe the broader community in non-communicable diseases to be aware of the work that we do. So the uh, partners in this project um, include, of course, uh, Yordis as project coordinator, but we also have uh, the for fortunate um, um, luck of having or, or, or um, appreciation of having a number of other partners, many of whom um, are on the call uh, or who you'll recognize from other rare disease initiatives, um, including Orphanet, um, who will be involved on much of the literature review on Newcastle University, who's also in, in, in charge of their literature review, but has a major role in helping moderate the work with you as a panel of experts. We have the Fondazione uh, Teleton Italia, who are in charge of evaluating the project. We have our experts from EC Nova, of course, who will be guiding the process um, of foresight. We have two European reference networks, um, and I'll be happy to ask or answer questions as to why those two are selected, but just to let you know here, their role really is to um, represent the voice of coordinators of any reference network. Um, and um, one of the major reasons why um, MetaBRN, for example, was selected um, headed by Maurizio Scarpa was his previous role as chair of the coordinators group for, for reference networks and Luca San Giorgi um, with his um, leadership on uh, regulatory and research aspects um, linking with the um, EMA and, and reference networks. But if, again, I'd like to just uh, emphasize the fact because this question comes up a lot, why these two networks is that their role it really is to speak on behalf of um, all of the reference networks that exist. And finally, we have our partners from the Imperial College of London um, who will be focusing on a analysis of um, drug development, the pipeline, and uh, more specifically, because it's probably um, um, a more recent um, investigation in, in, in that work is uh, the accessibility of treatments and how we can ensure in the next 10, 20 years that that is improved or continues. Just a quick um, overview of how this project's mapped out. So as with a number of, or as with all um, European uh, commission-based projects, we have a number of work packages. Yordis leading the coordination as well as the dissemination and sustainability of the activities. We have um, our partners from Newcastle and Orphanet working on the knowledge base and identifying the uh, trends along with EC Nova um, in work package four. We have EC Nova and the Imperial College of London working on um, building the scenario. So once we've identified the trends uh, and prioritize them, what are the possible futures we can imagine? And then we have the um, reference networks, Newcastle, Yordas, but of course, really all of the partners involved in any one of these steps in making sure that the scenarios that we prefer as a, a group, of course, there may be more than one, how we translate those into recommendations. And finally, evaluated by um, Fondation Teleton. 
We also have, um, sorry, two consultative um, bodies, one which is really more of a um, sounding board for the partners in uh, ensuring that what we do is not only um, sound from a methodological point of view, so, um, but also that we consider the larger health policy and perhaps policy context in general, um, and that we are making sure that we have our eye on all of the uh, forward-thinking um, technologies and innovations that we will see in the next 20 years that may have an influence on uh, treating and caring for people with rare diseases. So that research advisory board currently um, includes the following members. We have two on the right that have been grayed out because we don't have an official response yet. But as you'll see, they're made up really of three groups of individuals. One um, who are focused around health policy, um, in general, so um, for example, the um, European um, Association for Public Health, um, as well as experts on foresight in, uh, in general that can help guide um, the methods and the processes we put in, in, in place. We also have former director generals from DG Research, DG Sante and Connect. Um, and finally, we have um, one individual um, and perhaps more in the future coming from um, the point of view of new technologies. So in this case, from, from Microsoft. Um, now, I'm not going to go into great detail um, about each one of these steps, but I'd like to give you an overview before we go into them in the following presentations. So basically, the foresight process has uh, four steps, one of them being the uh, putting in place of our consultative body. And I'll let Vicky um, go into greater detail about how we did that, but that's certainly been a critical step and where we are still um, today, making sure that that um, panel includes not only stakeholders um, from all points of view, but also as many European countries and beyond as possible, um, and a nice overview of the um, groups of rare diseases, so reflecting all of the groupings in, in the reference networks. Um, now that we more or less have that um, uh, body of you in place, um, thank you it, um, so much for all of those of you who have already formally responded um, and committed to helping us in this process, but we do anticipate to have a number more coming in in the, in the next week. Um, and of course, once those are done, they'll be publicly um, shared with all of you. For the moment, just as an update, we have um, roughly 120 uh, members and um, and look forward to more. So the first uh, step, once that consultative body has been put into place, will be establishing um, a knowledge base, just to make sure that we are all speaking um, on the same terms. So of course, we'll be covering a number of topics in this project, um, from social integration, to diagnosis, to research, to access, um, to the involvement of patients um, and more. Um, and in order to do that, we really need to make sure that everyone is speaking the same language. So that's the first step. The, and that will be, um, as I said, conducted by um, Orphanet primarily. The second step will be the identification of major trends and drivers. So with the help of EC Nova, you as a group um, will not only be able to use um, your published knowledge um, around what you feel will influence the next decade um, or two of rare diseases, but also things that might not be um, publicly available yet. And that's really the beauty of a foresight exercise is extracting that information um, from your expertise. Once those trends and drivers are um, identified, they'll be prioritized. As you are all aware now, we will have a workshop in the fall, November 7th, um, and that will be one of the major objectives of that workshop will be once um, we've virtually discussed as a panel of experts identifying these trends to present to you the, the, the final findings, if you will, of which ones we've identified as a community of being the most important, uncertain, and therefore requiring um, policies. The third step will be, given how we prioritize those trends, 
what will the future look like um, with potential a number of potential future scenarios. We will then um, have a level of voting, if you will, not only um, from our group here, but also from uh, patients who are signed up to the Rare Barometer Voices platform, giving an opportunity to patients um, who are not on the panel of experts or who may not even necessarily be affiliated um, officially with a rare disease organization to also give their point of view. Um, we'll have a workshop um, at the ECRD, the European Conference for Rare Diseases, happening in May um, in Stockholm from um, the 15th on as another place to refine those scenarios and um, a number of regional workshops, and I'll go into more detail in, in upcoming slides, that will make sure that the um, trends, drivers, and then potential scenarios that we put forward um, take into consideration the, the national point of view. And once we've all uh, agreed on what those preferred scenarios are, the trickiest step probably will to be to translate those into policy recommendations and again refining them from both the EU and, and national perspective and those will be presented formally um, at the end of the project um, to the Parliament and, and Commission. So I mentioned the panel of experts. I just wanted to reiterate the fact that this is not the only um, body of experts that will be bringing their expertise to the table. So I mentioned patients um, in general, of course, this is one of Eurydice's major roles. And the tool that we'll use to do that is Rare Barometer Voices, um, but also a number of workshops, um, one of which is coming up um, in a few weeks in Bucharest at our uh, next um, Eurydice um, membership meeting, um, in which case we'll start a similar process from the patient point of view. We also have an opportunity, a unique opportunity, I think in this project to ask um, citizens in general what they think. Um, and so we hope to organize what's called a citizen conference, um, although it will probably take place over a number of discussions. The idea being to bring um, forward the opinion of young citizens, youth, whether they're advocates, students, um, or perhaps not directly um, involved in, in rare diseases for the moment, but to ask them to contribute how they think this fits in um, with general um, priorities uh, in our in our world and in, in our future. And then finally, we'll of course um, be bringing um, forward the, the opinions of healthcare professionals and health authorities through the reference network framework. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail of the panel of experts because Vicky will do that in a minute, but just to let you know that we have tried as much as possible to cover all of our bases. And here I'll just quickly go through who, who does what again. So the knowledge base being primarily conducted by um, the Orphanet team through both the classic literature search. Um, uh, we'll also have the input of the state of the art resource being a significant portion um, um, of the information that we'll all have as experts at hand to be able to consider um, trends and drivers and um, somewhat gray literature um, search performed by both my team and EC Nova to capture uh, other foresight studies that maybe aren't in the rare disease um, field specifically, but will certainly have an influence. Again, we'll scan the horizon to list trends, um, disruptive events, wild cards, and weak signals, and Giovanna will go into a bit more detail quickly about what those might be. Um, we will be putting together as a group um, consistent and coherent futures. So we use the words consistent and coherent to make sure, of course, that we don't um, um, propose something in one area of work that contradicts another. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, through a number of steps and, and opportunities, meetings, um, surveys, so both qualitative and, and quantitative um, methodologies to really help refine those to make sure that they are actually representing all of our expectations um, and needs for the future. And finally, um, a set of policy recommendations that will um, be put together by what we call backcasting. So considering a scenario and translating how do we actually make, how do we get there um, through policy. 
so I'd just like to finish with a few words on the fact that, um, again, I think this marks a very critical opportunity to ensure that we maintain rare diseases as um, a health priority in Europe um, and beyond, and that what we're doing in Europe, um, as was mentioned in the video, is very much um, admired and replicated in other parts of the world, um, and that we should certainly try our best not to lose the momentum of all the efforts that have been made in the last decade um, and keep in the mind that although we have had great successes without vigilance and, and constant effort that progress can certainly be reversed and we would when we would absolutely um, like to avoid that from from happening um, just again a number of dates for you to keep in mind so i mentioned the membership meeting for your members coming up in bucharest our panel of experts workshop which will actually be back to back um, to the Eurodis council of national alliances and council of european federations meetings that will happen on the 7th of November in Brussels, and we'll give you more information um, as we have it very soon. We will have um, a number of opportunities to discuss the work in RARE 2030 during the European Conference on Rare Diseases, and quite specifically, uh, we'll have a workshop as a group um, together. At that point in time, we'll be in the scenario building phase of our work, um, and so we'll have already come up with a consensus of trends, and we will be considering how to um, translate those um, into scenarios. We will have had input already from the Rare Barometer Survey, and we can really just make sure and refine them um, that they make sense in, in our evolve, all of our respective uh, contexts. Um, finally, I just sort of earmark here, although it's not official, that um, reference networks um, to date have had annual conferences, and though that might be a potential opportunity to um, present and gather the input of that, um, group uh, of stakeholders in fall of 2020 and throughout next year um, a number of regional workshops which we will ideally align with upcoming EU presidencies. These are not confirmed, um, these um, locations, but um, for, for obvious reasons um, we think it might be most effective to try to align those with um, the EU presidencies and make sure that the implementation of the recommendations is taken up um, as effectively as possible. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'm now going to um, pass on the floor um, to Vicky, I believe. Um, and again, many thanks for joining um, as an official member of the panel of experts and to our webinar today. Uh, Giovanna, before, sorry, yeah, yes. I think just before I come in, Giovanna's just gonna talk to you for five minutes from Mr. Nova, just to try to sketch out what foresight as a concept is all about. So um, I think Anna, if you keep yes. being the green master and go into Giovanna, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Thank you, Vicky, yeah. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Giovanna Giuffre and I work for Isinova. Um, just in five minutes, I just would like to present few aspects of foresight activities. Um, we are a consultancy based in Rome. I, just to introduce ourselves as we are the new in the fields. We come from foresight, not from rare disease. And we are a small consultancy based in Rome, specialized in European project. Uh, we have been working in the last 10 years, especially on foresight and governance across sector. If you can show next slide. So there have been some health projects, but we have been work also on research priorities on, or socioeconomic development in general. So yeah, our role in uh, RARE 2030 will be especially on facilitating uh, the foresight activities development uh, on supporting expert dialogue and also in supporting the inclusion of a broader context and trends in health and healthcare. So we are with the external trying to mediate and make the most out of your input, ideas, uh, contribution. If we think about foresight, the first question is why thinking about the future? Is something the Commission is more and more financing? Uh, we believe is by the fact that the reality change with uh, high speed and complexity is increasing of phenomena, and there is really the uh, needs uh, uh, perceived by policymakers of uh, understanding what will be the long term consequence of the change happening and how we can anticipate those change, how we can make the most out of the opportunities and trade off which are the risks that could have a highest impact in the future. 
uh, how we detect the future uh, is mainly by dia dialogue with experts, with citizen, and supporting the creation about uh, supporting the creation of a consensus about priorities and uh, policy. Uh, this is a slide by uh, uh, GRC that has been working a lot on foresight. The pre previous one, sorry, Anna. And uh, as you can see, is really there are three main aspects: is thinking about the future, and is also a way of uh, um, looking beyond our priority that each organization has, each expert, uh, and trying to have uh, a broader view. Uh, there is a way of uh, debating the priorities, trying to find a consensus, and shaping the future by formulating policy recommendations that helps. Uh, to build a better future tomorrow. Uh, next slide uh, is just really giving um, an, a general overview of what is uh, uh, foresight activities development and is a mirroring, uh, it mirrors what Anna has presented before. So in all foresight studies, there is a moment in which we stop and look at the system as it is now. And this is the great work that has been carried out currently, especially uh, by Orphanet and the University of Newcastle about uh, what is the status quo, which are the topic, uh, how these uh, have been changed within the last 10 years. And then uh, after this uh, uh, looking at the present, uh, we will start to look at the future to the, depict uh, which are the trends and change on the opportunities uh, that we can uh, that we can see in the next uh, ten years uh, and twenty. This will helpful for us uh, to build scenarios. So there is two components. One is that is more analytical and is more desk research, and there is a component that is more uh, um, of uh, consultation and participation, and they are both reflected on how uh, the project have been. Uh, uh, built. This is uh, uh, just a few definitions, but I think we will go back on that on the next webinars. Uh, is uh, what is considered a trend, uh, what is a considered a mega trend, and what is a driver. And then there is this uh, category that we usually use uh, to um, uh, to categorize uh, uh, trends. Um, this is, is especially useful because often we focus on one of those uh, uh, categories, depending on our background. So some will be more focused on social fields, others on technology or economy. What we would like really in this exercise is to have a view on all aspects and trends that will be able to modify uh, the future we want to shape. Uh, this is a really a short overview, but uh, um, we'll be happy to discover more <laughs> along the project. Thanks. Thank you, Giovanna. And yes, just to re reiterate the fact that, as um, you know, we'll have a second um, webinar on the 29th of May, in which case we will go into much um, greater detail around um, the definitions and specifics of foresight. So Vicky will now go into um, more detail around the knowledge base um, and the activities of you uh, and your group as the panel of experts. So can you all, can you see my screen okay, Anna? Mm -hmm. I know I can't ask the rest of you. Um, you'll have noticed by now that you're all muted um, by design in this TC, and that's because I think we've got about 80 participants or so. Um, Rest assured, when you start to meet in your smaller panel subgroups, you're obviously not going to be muted. People will be able to jump in. But just because it's an introductory webinar and we wanted to cover quite a lot, um, and because we're aware with 80, 90 people, there's bound to be at least one person in an airport on their phone, and then it, the whole thing just crashes apart. So we decided to be really strict and to mute people so you can't speak. But you can post questions and comments in the, um, in the, the Q&A box, so please do do that. Um, we've heard about, um, we've heard from Anna, we've heard about the, the overview of the RARE 2030 project and that four part, um, the four steps into which it's divided. The project's not divided um, in a, in, in a, in a very strict way. So all of those different steps and all of our work packages really do feed each other and work closely together. 
And then you've also heard a very, very little bit from Giovanna, from our, our um, foresight experts, about this particular methodology of foresight studies. What I want to do now is to maybe bring it back down a little bit because there's a lot of information there to take on board. Um, so I'm going to try and bring it back to what we really want from all of you in the in the next few months and to see you know, where your role really, really comes in. So um, I'm leading what we're calling work package four. I know that work package numbers isn't particularly helpful, but um, this is really the, I'm just going to move that out of the way. This is really the, the work package about building and actually maybe a better term is clarifying our knowledge base and starting to map what we think will be the main drivers of change and the determinants of health and well-being for our very broad rare disease community. Um, but to do that, to start thinking about what drivers of change might be and what determinants of health are, um, you need to have a pretty good view of what's actually happening. So what the status quo is in rare diseases across Europe specifically, that's where we're focusing. But knowing that we're not living in a, in a silo for rare diseases, we do want to factor in, as Anna has explained, some of the more global um, developments and global trends. So we have a, it's a small consortium. So the, the, the official partners involved um, in this work package are Isinova, Insum, Eurodis, and the Italian um, Telecom Foundation. But actually all of our partners are participating actively to this. And all of you on this teleconference, we also hope that you can play a key role in this. Um, essentially what this, this work package is doing is we are trying to establish the status quo of rare disease activities across European countries and we're using this to identify and build consensus on our determinants of health and our drivers of change. So the first thing that we, we are doing and have been doing, um, particularly myself at Newcastle and, and Charlotte and Anna Rath's team um, and Florent who works with them at Orphanet, is to try to gather and update as much relevant information as we can to see really what's happening across the very broad rare disease field. Then we need to try to take the results of this, this knowledge base mapping, which I'm going to go into a bit more detail about in a second. And we need to try to present that to all of you as our panel of experts in a way that's going to be somehow digestible and isn't going to mean you spending days and days reading through papers. Um, so this is what we're going to explain in the next 20 minutes is to tell you what we've been doing and to, to let you know what you can expect to receive as the panel. Um, hopefully, all of you are on this call because you've either accepted your, your role in the panel of experts or you're, you're sort of checking it out to, to find out who, for instance, if you're from an ERN, I know one or two of you are still trying to determine who the best person is. Um, but you're all here because you're interested, that's great. And you should all have received at some point um, a link to our terms of reference for this panel of experts which really does go through step by step what we, what we want from you. Um, but just in case you haven't been able to read that thoroughly, um, the first thing to note about this panel is that it is intentionally very, very broad. If we're trying to come up with what we think are going to be future policies for the rare disease field, we need ownership and buy-in from the broad rare disease field, not just from the seven or eight partners in the project. Um, so our panel is very, very broad, and that's important because I think you know, we, we don't yet know, we haven't started this project with a, a fixed idea of exactly what's going to come out in two years time in terms of the content of the policies that we come up with. It may be, as Anna and, and Jan alluded to earlier, that actually we start a new kind of a cycle of um, European policy um, soft law, as we call it, so a new kind of council recommendation. It may be that there are specific topics which are lacking European level recommendations or even sort of interregional recommendations around particular issues. So if you can read the slightly poor resolution um, image here, these are just a collection of some of the recommendations that came out from the, the older expert groups, so the USAID and the Commission expert group. Um, the ones on ERNs, for instance, have been hugely influential and a lot of what's now here in terms of the networks um, started off its life in this kind of policy generation scenario. So it may be that there are specific topics, um, something like newborn screening, for example, that don't have any recommendations and could benefit from these. Or it could be that some of the existing ones, for instance, on national plans and strategies could do with an update. But because we don't know what those topics will be or what that focus will be, we've had to build this panel very, very broadly. 
And these two slides, um, you can find this in your terms of reference document. It's an annex to that and it basically lists the different stakeholders who are part of this panel. Now somebody posted in the chat earlier and said, well, we have a list of the members so we know who we're working with. And yes, you absolutely will. Um, we're still waiting for um, the confirmations from some of our, our participants. But the key thing I think to remember is that almost everybody was invited to participate in this panel, not necessarily because of their individual expertise. There are so many hundreds of, of experts out there. Um, I mean, if you think about the ERNs, every healthcare provider will have experts in rare diseases. So to make this somewhat manageable and to keep this under 250 as an absolute max, we had to think about inviting people um, because of the, the stakeholder group to which they belong. So the different groups that they can tap into. So for instance, um, the, uh, let me give an example. So we've got here um, some representatives from um, European research networks and infrastructures. So we have invited a few people from the European Joint Program. Um, again, we couldn't invite everyone because it's huge. So we've invited the, the pillar co-leads for that. So the idea would be that those people, for example, Rima or Franz, you would be there because of your capacity as a, as a co-leader in one of those pillars, but you would be expected or we hope you would be able to cascade information about what this project is doing to your colleagues there and in turn bring their, their, their perspectives on trends and developments into this group. Um, so the, the, the short answer as to why you're all on this call is that um, we, we've tried to make sure that we have really good coverage across all these different broad stakeholder groups and they range from patients to policymakers. Um, the ERN stakeholders are particularly important to us here. And actually, if you look at the, the list of participants to this call, we have a, a huge number of, of people um, from the ERN field, which is fantastic. Um, you'll get all of the slides, a few people have asked this already, so I'm not going to go in tremendous detail about the membership. You'll have all of these slides and you'll also get a recording of this webinar. But just to catch you up on where we are with the invitations, um, we sent out invitations to about 250 people, so we're hoping in the end to get a final commitment of between maybe 150, 170. If all 250 say yes, fantastic. We're aware that we're working with very busy people. And we've also tried to approach some people who are not directly in the rare disease expert field. So that's kind of the balance that we have to strike in this project. Um, rare diseases aren't operating in a bubble. We need to think about communities like e-health, like precision medicine, um, you know, data management and artificial intelligence and how all of these things could play into what we're doing. So the panel of experts um, will meet twice in these introductory webinars. So today is your first one. And the second one, in case you haven't got that date, it's the 29th of May from 2 till around 3.30 Central Time. But you'll get an invitation specifically for that. So that second one is going to be um, much more of an explanation of what foresight really is and what we actually mean tangibly when we talk about things like drivers of change and determinants of health in different communities. So you can start to get to grips with that. But even if we end up with around 150, 170 people, that's too big to beat as a panel and to really have um, creative discussions. So as you hopefully all know by now, um, you will have been invited once you accepted your initial invitation to uh, click on a form which will allow you to rank your preferences for eight subgroups. So we're going to split, roughly split this big panel into eight very broad topics, each of which covers lots of smaller issues. Um, Charlotte is going to uh, just show these on the screen in a few minutes time as part of the, the work they've been doing on finding literature related to each of them. So um, we will, once we have the lists of who's involved in each of those eight subgroups, we'll be um, setting up a mailing list for each of them. And we'll be scheduling foreseeably two two-hour teleconferences between June and September. So we'll try to set those up via doodles because they're going to be significantly smaller groups than this group. Um, so please do look out for those. What are you going to receive in advance? So we'll have a little bit of homework for you to make sure that we, we can make those teleconferences as meaningful as possible. And you're going to be sent what we're calling knowledge-based fact sheets. Um, 
what we'll do in the first or the start of those calls is we'll quickly look through those fact sheets and then we'll start to move much more into what you all feel are the trends, what do you think are the drivers of change for your particular topics. So just to give you an idea of what's going to be on those, those fact sheets and what you're going to be looking at and where it's come from, um, there are three main um, sources of information which we're going to use to populate the, these knowledge-based fact sheets. So on the one hand, we're going to take a little bit of the knowledge from horizon scanning of um, foresight studies outside of the rare disease field and see what are the broader trends around health, for instance, and research. But the two that I wanted to talk about in a little bit more detail so you know what you're looking at and where it came from are these two. So the literature review, which um, the Orphanet team has been performing. And the second is a resource which some of you will know really well and some of you might not know at all. And this is a resource called the State of the Art of Rare Disease Activities in Europe. I'm going to abbreviate it here as the SOTAR. So this is a resource that has existed in some form or another since about 2011. And actually Charlotte Rodwell on the call uh, and also Segalene May were really instrumental in creating this many years ago. And the resource has been through several different evolutions. It's been um, supported and created by the European Joint Actions in the past. And we've been able to keep this going a little bit in the gap between um, and also use a little bit of the funding in RARE 2030 to try to reinvigorate this, this resource and collect new data. What's important about the state of the art resource, I think, is that it fills a gap that nothing else fills at the moment. So we tend to know a lot about what's happening in our particular diseases, for instance. I think the ERNs are doing a brilliant job in mapping expertise and knowledge and resources that are available for very broad groups of disease. And that's a really exciting time. Um, but we don't have a place where we can really bring together what each of our countries is doing, for instance, around rare diseases thinking very broadly. So that's what the state of the art resource tries to do. And it's got several different parts. I'll talk about two of these. One of them is what we call the state of the art overview resource, um, overview report, apologies. You will hopefully be familiar with this one because we tweeted a lot about it last summer um, when we, we published this at the end of August. So this is quite a long document. You can find it by the link above. Um, and it's about 100 pages now, but you can search it very easily by different sections. It doesn't tell you what's specifically happening in rare bone or rare muscle disease, but it does tell you about most of the things that we hope people would want to know or need to know about rare disease policy and activities across disease areas. So you can read about the history of these you know, policy bibles for rare diseases, the commission communication, the council recommendation, the expert groups. You can have a look at what's happening in terms of the political framework outside of Europe, so um, which countries have national plans and orphan drug legislation. We get a lot of data in here from the Orphanet database, which looks at, um, for example, genetic testing laboratories. So what um, tests for what diseases exist in which countries, where do we find the centers of expertise who are now in some cases officially part of ERNs. So there's lots of maps and charts and graphs in here, but it's a really good resource if you're interested in something like rare disease registries, for instance, and you want to know what's being done on this topic, um, what initiatives are looking at this, if you want to know what the Joint Research Centre is doing about this, if you want to know what um, RD Connect or EJP was planning around um, rare disease registries, it's a good place to go for information. So do have a look at that. Um, we will be updating that a little bit as we go across the project, probably towards the end of the summer. But the most important um, part of the state of the art resource, I would say for your purposes in this panel, is the country data collection. Again, some of you will know this very well because you are directly involved and have been for a long, long time. But for those who aren't, um, what we did under RD Action, the old Joint Action for Rare Diseases, is we established what we call data contributing committees or DCCs and we did this for each of the EU member states and the idea is that you would have a small group of people who together could sort of put their minds together and bring their knowledge of what's happening in their country for rare diseases and you would get a bit more of a multi-stakeholder perspective on developments. So in most cases these DCCs are made up of 
a competent national authority representative. And traditionally, this was always the person who was serving in the, the USED or the expert group. So typically somebody from a Ministry of Health. The second member would be somebody from the Orphanet national team. So nearly all the countries in Europe have a, a national Orphanet team who collects information. So we wanted to bring them in together with the, the member state reps. And then last but not least, we have a national alliance of rare disease patient organizations representative. So what we've been doing in the last couple of months is basically preparing new materials to relaunch this resource because to be honest under the old joint action we really had to do we did one data collection but then and i guess it's partially my fault um we focused much more on the erm policy support in the end for various reasons so i'm picking this up a little bit from not quite from scratch but it's taken a while to prepare our new lists of who the names are around these people and to prepare new invitation lists, etc. Um, we've also included this time in CC to these emails. Um, we've included the Board of Member States representatives at the request of several of our partners and several of the, the BOMS reps themselves. So I think you're all familiar with the Board of Member States. Um, their role is, of course, to look after ERNs and not any and all rare disease issues. But we were hopeful that actually by giving some of those people the opportunity to become more involved in their, their country's broader rare disease activities, some of them might be very interested in taking that up and, and running with that. So the countries are um, updating their information. Um, I'll accelerate a little bit here. So what information do we collect for this resource and how do we do it? Well, we actually collect information, at least a little bit of information on a lot of topics. And that's intentional. So you can see on the right hand side, just that's the list of the different questions, different question topics that we ask about. So we ask about national plans and strategies, whether you have one, is it expired? Is it being implemented? Does it have money? We ask about things like um, newborn screening. So do you have a national policy for newborn screening for rare diseases? What diseases do you screen for, etc. Um, the way that we collect the information is through an online survey interface called Line Survey, which is good for this because it's multi-user. So it means that in theory, all three or four members of those data contributing committees can log in at any time or the same time, and you can see the information that your other colleagues have put in for different sections. So what some of the countries do, which is great, is they kind of divide these up. And the ones which really you need kind of a ministry or a ministry of research person to complete, they go ahead and start on that, whereas maybe the patient representative starts on different sections and then everybody hopefully has a chance to confer on the data before it's submitted. The point that I really want to highlight on this is that we didn't just dream up all of these questions. They are designed to allow us to collect the data which countries um, agreed to collect by an important set of recommendations issued in 2013 which were the USED recommendations on core indicators for national plans and strategies. You can just probably see on the top right hand corner here, this is a list of some of the indicators from that document. So around the national plans, for instance, um, countries are asked or, or member states were asked to report if they have regulations or laws that actually support the creation of a national plan and there are different answers that they can give. And then it asks, is there some sort of a committee, an advisory committee to oversee the creation and or the implementation of a national plan or strategy? Because just having the plan is not enough. You need to try to make sure that wherever possible, countries are being supported to actually implement those documents and they're not just sitting on somebody's desk. So what we can do, and this is an example of the kind of logic that it follows. So you have leading questions that the countries complete. For instance, is there a dedicated body, for example, an expert advisory group, which oversees the drafting or implementation of your plan or strategy. And so countries select, and then there's a more free text thing where you ask about how that body's actually meeting, whether it's working or not. And what that does is when you get that data from all the countries, you can put together statistics. So the little bit of text on the bottom right, I won't go into in much detail because it's a bit outdated now anyway, but you can draw conclusions. So at that point in time of the 19 plans that were still active, um, 15 of them had reported that there was no dedicated funding behind the national plan or strategy, which is really important. So what are we gonna do with all of this data that we're collecting at the moment? Um, the most important thing for your purposes 
is that we're going to take um, the top level of this data. So we're going to take the stats like I just showed you on what's happening across each of our countries in some of these crucial areas. And we're going to put those into these knowledge base fact sheets. So each knowledge base fact sheet will be around six to eight pages, no longer than that. And it's designed to give you a snapshot of where we are. So we can start to talk about, you know, what are our trends around countries, again, sticking with the national plans and strategies. What are the trends around countries actually funding and supporting national activities? How involved are different stakeholder groups in these? More, um, a little bit further afield in the project, what we'll do over the summer once our, our panel of experts has started to meet is that we will use the information that the countries are giving us even now to update the pages that each country has. So at the moment, each country has a little web page, um, which is still under the RD Action website, actually. And what you find there is, so this is the Slovak Republic page, you find a little link to their Orphanet resources and a link to a national plan or strategy if there is one. But we do a little summary, like a real snapshot of what's happening in the Slovak Republic. And you can scroll down to the bottom of the page where you can access the full report which we, we elaborate using the information that our data contributing committee from Slovak Republic will give to us. So really by the end of, end of September, October, we'll have really nice updated um, country reports for, for all of our EU member states. And we'll use that information, that knowledge further in the RARE 2030 project when we start to look at some of those um, you know, regional workshops and, and delve a bit deeper into what we're coming up with. Um, so those of you who are involved in the state of the art resource, who are part of the data contributing committees, um, just a quick plea to you. I know that it's a lot of work to do. I know it's not easy to update that data. This time it's a bit better because you are using, you're building upon everything that you entered back in 2016, 2017. So hopefully this will be a bit easier. But I think it's an important resource that we, we try to keep going and try to, um, you know, um, reinvigorate again because it does I think fill a gap that we we really have in the rare disease field. Um, we can also do all sorts of exciting things with this about thinking about how ERNs for instance um, can, can engage more with this kind of process now. Maybe we think about bringing an ERN representative somehow from each country into these data contributing committees in future for instance. Um, but that's for the future. So a lot of the information that you're going to get on these knowledge base fact sheets, and there will be at least one, maybe two for each of these panel of experts subgroups. A lot of that is going to come from this up to date um, national state of the art data, but not all of it. So Charlotte um, and Florent at Orphanet have been doing a huge piece of work around uh, a literature review. So Charlotte, I'm going to um, mute myself and maybe you can unmute yourself yeah. and just um, go through these slides for us. Thank you. I'll let you know when to turn. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. I'm Charlotte Rodwell in SEM Orphanet. I'm just going to firstly introduce the two main resources we're bringing to literature review on the INSEM side and then talk a little bit about the methodology behind the literature uh, review process uh, that's happening at Orphanet at the moment. So in terms of the resources, I'm just going to quickly describe uh, the two main resources we're using for the exercise, the Orphan News article archives and the Orphanet database. Change the slide please, thank you. So. In terms of the, um, uh, the Orphan News article database, uh, many of you will know that at Orphanet we have been producing um, since 2004 in English uh, and French a newsletter called Orphan News. Uh, it has around uh, 14,000 subscribers at the moment. We recently um, launched an Italian translation as well. Uh, the newsletter comes out twice a month and has a complete review of the political and scientific news in the field of rare diseases. Here I've highlighted a number of the different um, um, fields that we cover. So it ranges from European international news to uh, elements around bioinformatics and data management, registries, health economics, screening and also ethical legal social issues. We also have a review on the quality of life uh, um, studies, study design aspects and of course on orphan drugs. 
The systematic review of the literature that we carry out for Orphan News um, will also be feeding the rare 2030 uh, exercise. Uh, we have around 30, uh, 60 survey publications covering both the peer-reviewed literature and the grey literature um, uh, surveyed uh, twice a month. We include in the survey relevant newsletters and websites in the field of rare diseases. This also includes the activities of the European reference networks. And we also use, of course, um, resources such as PubMed, Science Direct, Scopus, Biomed Central, and Google searches, uh, where we have alerts for certain keywords. We're also um, um, survey, uh, surveying more and more um, posts on social media. Um, for the past two years, we've um, started to, to go through our archives retrospectively and prospectively to index articles with an in-house thesaurus of terms. Uh, to describe them, the sort of tags, and also to in index them with uh, author numbers when the articles uh, deal with a specific or a number of specific diseases. This allows users and us for this project to be able to search the archives uh, by these terms and also carry out uh, free text searches. Your turn, please. Thank you. The second uh, main uh, resource that we'll be using is of course the Orphanet database of rare diseases and orphan drugs. Uh, notably we have, be, we have a number of aggregated data sets that we make available for research purposes via a site called Orpha Data that we will be exploiting to um, have a view um, of a number of certain um, a number of uh, aspects in the field of rare diseases. As you may know, uh, Orphanet collects uh, data on a certain amount of um, expert resources in uh, 35 countries in Europe and beyond. This includes uh, data on diagnostic tests and laboratories in the countries, centers of expertise, and of course, European reference networks, patient organizations, research activities such as projects, clinical trials and registries, of course, orphan drugs. So with this data, we can inform for this, um, for this project a number of questions around the distribution of expertise and availability of resources in the field of rare diseases. Uh, this can show and demonstrate the necessity of cross-border approaches, for example, and also present um, a picture of the coverage of treatment options for rare diseases. This data has been used previously in the state-of-the-art report, notably the, um, the overview report. So with the data we've previously shown and, and, um, and uh, anal analysis that we're going to carry out in, uh, in this project, we'll be able to show an evolution in, in the field. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to show you um, how we are going to be contributing to building the knowledge base for the RARE 2030 project. First, I'm going to explain how we've approached the literature review by the thematic groupings that we've suggested for the uh, work with the panel of experts. And then I'm going to detail a bit more how the methodological review will be, uh, methodology will be conducted uh, at Orphanet uh, for the literature review. Next slide, please. So the literature review and the results will be pre presented to you as a panel of experts through eight thematic groupings in a fact sheet form. There are eight main themes that we have been uh, able to identify and, and group uh, subtopics underneath. I'm just going to go through these so you can have a better idea of what they englobe. Uh, the first is a topic on political and strategic frameworks relevant to rare diseases. So this will include national plans and strategies for rare diseases and other related issues and other types of plans, such as uh, plans for cancers, uh, cancer and uh, genomics. Uh, this will include elements related to sustainability of health systems, uh, European level forum or fora for rare disease policy and also rare disease stakeholder networks. Of course, this is a descriptive, um, uh, it, it's not limited to these, these issues, it's just to describe what can be found within. On the second topic will be around data collection and use. So we will be looking here, of course, at uh, current and future roles of registries, strategies for interoperability, aspects related to ontologies and terminologies. Uh, the question of fair data, electronic health records, and of course, coding and monitoring of rare diseases. 
The third topic will be around the availability and accessibility of orphan medicinal products and medical devices. So we'll be looking at state therapy development status quo, accessibility of drugs, HGA considerations, elements around pricing, repurposing and public private partnerships. The fourth topic will be around research, basic clinical and translational research. Here we'll be looking at um, uh, trends and drivers around research infrastructures, research policies, national and transnational research programs, tools to support more efficient and cost-effective research, and innovation-centric health systems. Next slide, please. The fifth topic will be around diagnostics. So here we'll be covering newborn screening, genetic testing capacities, prevention, cross-border testing, uh, next generation sequ sequencing in the clinical setting, artificial intelligence, undiagnosed patients, and genetic counseling. The sixth, the sixth topic will be around social integration of rare diseases and holistic care. So we'll be looking at integrated and holistic approaches to care, rare disease appropriate assessment of functioning, social research and burden of illness research, and also aspects around helplines and information around living with a rare disease. The seventh topic will be around patient engagement, patient empowerment and patient centered approaches to rare disease issues. So we'll be looking here at strategies for patient empowerment, support of and for patient organizations, involvement of citizens in mobile health and direct quality of life data collection, as well as definition of patient related outcome measures. The last topic will be one on accessing healthcare. So here we'll be looking at center of expertise creation and functioning, also aspects around European reference networks, such as integration of the ERNs into health systems, development and use of clinical practice guidelines and clinical decision support tools to reduce inequalities to access to care and e-health. So as you see, the, the, to the topics here, we're just giving you a flavor of what's in each of them, but we've decided uh, to, um, this would be an interesting way to approach the, uh, the, um, the literature review on our side and also present uh, present the, the data that's coming out of the literature review to you for, for review and reflection. Next slide, please. So coming to my final slide here is um, um, an overview of the literature review methodology that's being carried out here at INSERM at the Orphanet team. Um, for each of the themes that we've just seen, we've defined a list of key words and often used thesaurus terms from our thesaurus of terms that, and we have the constructed them and prioritized them. We'll of course be uh, leading a prospective lit policy literature survey using the orphan news literature review methodology. So this is the one I cited earlier that we lead twice monthly for the production of the newsletter. And we will be carrying out a retrospective policy literature survey. This will include all geographical regions and we'll be looking back to uh, 2010. The uh, retrospective literature review will be organized into three steps. We will we'll be searching the archives using the key, the key terms that we've defined for each of the uh, topics. Uh, so we'll be using this controlled vocabulary to search through the archives of indexed articles. Uh, the second step will be to ensure that we haven't missed any, um, any of the relevant articles that might have maybe been uh, miss. Uh, um, mis-indexed in the past. So we'll be using the keywords in the free text Boolean search engine that we have for the Orphan News archives. And to complement this, we'll be having an additional uh, search using keywords uh, in, um, in uh, resources such as PubMed, also Google Scholar and uh, search engines such as Google and Quant. So for each of these search uh, strategies, we'll be recording uh, the uh, exact research, uh, search um, and the result volume. The most pertinent articles for each of the theme will be described in an annex that we will provide to the fact sheets, but in each of the fact sheets, uh, maybe Vicky will just um, describe a little bit more on the later webinar, we will be um, really bringing out the most interesting articles that give us a, a view of the developments on the past 10 years and also um, the the trends to, and drivers in the area to come. So we're hoping to provide you with a digest but also the possibility to access this annex and have a few view of all the most interesting uh, articles that have come out of literature review. 
So I've said the key publications will be presented in these thematic fact sheets and we will be um, giving a, a view uh, of the uh, of the evolution of each of these areas and also the status quo by carrying out ad hoc anal analysis of the Orphanet database using the Orphanet data sets. Uh, so this would hopefully give a, a, a quite view, few, um, excuse me, a quite complete view of the topics. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, Okay, so last slide. Um, so we scheduled about two hours for this introductory webinar, but knowing that we didn't actually want to use that full slot of time unless people were really, really keen. Um, so I'll just finish up with a couple of, of um, pleas to, to each of you as panel members. And then if you've been putting any questions or comments um, into the Q&A box or into the chat box, then we'll also go through those in a, in a second. Um, so that was just to really explain to you where we are with the panel of expert invitations um, to emphasize what, what we need you to do next, but also to give you an idea of tangibly what you're going to be receiving um, at you know, the end of, end of this month, end of May, ready for the first um, subgroup panel uh, teleconferences. So a quick um, a particular plea for the ERN coordinator. So I said at the beginning that you know, the ERN community is a really important um, component of this, this big panel of experts. It's also, as always, one of the trickiest to manage because we have so many networks, of course, and we want to be inclusive and make sure every network has a formal member. Um, so we sent all of those. I sent um, individual um, alert emails to each of the coordinators last month. But I know in some cases, the coordinators themselves will be that, that um, official representative. In other cases, you, you wanted to um, delegate this to a colleague, say somebody in one of your working groups, or, or maybe to, even to a project manager if somebody's very involved. So for those, I think most of you actually have already come back and given us your, your definite person. If you haven't done that yet, please do do that um, because then Anna can issue that person with their formal invitation. And then we also wanted a second DRN representative, which was a patient representative. And again, I know that selecting a patient representative is not always an easy thing to do. So if you have, um, if you are still considering who your patient representative should be, um, please, you know, do give us a name for a person, either somebody that the, the Eurodis partner suggested or somebody else that you want to select. Absolutely fine. Just let us know. And then Anna can issue that person with their official invitation as well. Because what we want to really do over the next, ideally the next week, if possible, is to, to try to get everybody um, signed up to those subgroups. So Charlotte showed you what the eight subgroup topics are. Um, we said in the in the in that invitation email, um, we asked people to rank basically all eight of those in terms of what would be your first preference to be part of. What are you most interested or most expert in? Um, all the way down to eight. So the idea is that we would invite most people, expect most people um, to join three of those subgroups. If you want to join fewer or if you want to join more, then you can. Um, the reason being, we thought we didn't you know if we tried to expect everybody to join all eight. Um, if we're thinking about two two-hour teleconferences before the middle of September for each of them, that quickly becomes a lot of your calendar, calendar time and we know how busy everybody is. So if you haven't done that already, please do do that and then we can see what the numbers look like, see which are the most popular and make sure that you get your, your first choices. Um, I suppose the most important other next step at this point is to save in your calendar if you haven't already got this this date for our second introductory webinar so again this will be one where we have the full group and it'll be even larger by then um, and what we'll do on this second webinar is we won't go through the full scope of the project again but we will focus a little bit more on what one of these knowledge-based fact sheets look like so we'll have um well we have all of them ready to some extent um, but we'll have at least one or two much more mature. So we'll show you how the data, how the information is going to be presented for your, for your thoughts on those knowledge-based fact sheets. And we'll also ask our ISTANOVA colleagues to give us a little bit more um, 
of an introduction to this, this foresight methodology. Because for a lot of us, you know, we know the rare disease field very, very well, but maybe don't know this methodology around foresight studies. Um, I think it's really helpful to hear tangibly what people mean by terms like um, drivers of change, you know, what would be a determinant of health and well-being for our community or for other communities. So we'll have a little bit more of a practical um, demonstration of that next time as well. And Anna will also feed back to us next time at the end of May on um, a patient um, a patient representative meeting that will take place, um, as she explained, as part of the Eurodis membership meeting later this month, where um, a group of um, patient representatives will be talking through some of their thoughts about trends in the rare disease field that they've come across. So those are the immediate um, next steps, I think, from, from my side. And that's the last slide that I have at the moment. So I'm just going to come out of the presentation and stop sharing my screen um, and see if we've got any questions. If you do have any questions that you haven't put in the Q&A or in the chat, then please feel free to do so at the moment. Uh, let's have a look. I see two questions um, mm -hmm. for you here, Vicky. One, um, a specific question around the state of the art for Switzerland. Wondering yep. if there is one and if so, um, where? Mm -hmm. So the answer to that is there isn't, but there will be. So I mentioned um, that we've been focusing on the, the, the European member states. So that was the most urgent thing was as the same as in the past. The, the focus has always been on the 28 EU member states. But going back to the older days of the state of the art resource, um, when actually Charlotte used to collect the data from, from countries, um, at the time, we, um, we, we had a, an agreement that we could include the countries who were participating to the, um, to the expert groups as observers. So in the old reports, there was a little section for Switzerland, for Serbia, I think for Turkey, for Israel, I think for Iceland as well. So there was a very small number of countries um, where we, we gathered data from the official ministry representatives. So you will be hearing something from me very soon um, for the, the people that we think are part of your data contributing committee for those countries to ask you to do the same as the 28 member states have been asked to do over the last few weeks. Um, so it will be coming for sure and the report will take a little bit longer but we'll, we'll get there. We also need to think about where actually to put these country pages because at the moment the pages for each country, so the page for the Slovak Republic that I showed before, giving you an idea of what's happening there for rare diseases, um, they're still on the RD Action website at the moment, which I think is okay because the website's it's not going to vanish, um, but we need to think about where, where to put those, whether we put them on an internal server here, um, or, tr or migrate them to the Rare2030 site, but we'll, for now, they'll be accessible where they always have been. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so just quickly to go through, because I'm conscious of time, we're, we're nearing the end. Um, so um, Pauline, thank you for your question um, about the subtopics. So at this point, you should have received um, an inv invitation from Vicky to rank um, your preferences. If you haven't, I've noted down to make sure that you get that um, email again, but the same goes to all of the other participants on this call. If you have not received um, a, a table where you select um, the areas in which you would like to or, or find you could contribute the most to, then um, just let Vicky and I know and we're happy to forward that again. Uh, we have a question about the next webinar slot. Um, whether it's three to five or three thirty to four, um, I'll have to look back. But just to be sure, um, that in the next reminder and invitation, we'll obviously make that very clear. Um, unless my colleague from Eurodis is here, I don't think he is with us anymore. Um, but thanks for booking the three to five slot for the moment, and we'll specify um, exactly the one and a half hours mm -hmm. that are in there. Um, we have a question around the UK, that there are a lot of partners from the UK. Um, yes, we had the same um, fears, if you will, um, in this somewhat turbulent time. But um, yeah, just to quickly respond that in terms of membership in, in a European um, project, we have, um, we and all, and all um, 
organizations involved in European projects for the moment, um, there's an agreement in, in place that um, allows activities to seamlessly happen through the end of 2020. So as far as our project is concerned, we're all good. Um, and in fact, I guess it's even more of an importance given the uncertainty of um, UK situation that they continue being involved mm -hmm. in, in these discussions to avoid any sort of rupture in, in networking across all European countries. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, and also on that one, I guess I think a lot of the time people are panicking, especially from the ERN sphere, because of course for the ERNs it's very different because of the cross-border healthcare directive routing the network. So there, whether you're a member state or not, is incredibly important. Um, it's dare I say it less so important in in the non-ERN in most of the other non-ERN sources of EU funding because our government, such as it is, has at least committed that no matter what outcome there is the current projects where UK partners are involved they will um, pledge they will basically make up any funding that no longer can come from Brussels it'll come from from London instead so it's the same as for Horizon 2020 projects basically until they're they're finished um, it's it is actually a business as usual so that's that side is okay we have a comment here again around um, surgical in, in, um, mm -hmm. interventions in the context of therapy. So thanks for bringing that forward because absolutely, if it's not clear in our slides, perhaps it's not clear in our minds as well. And we will certainly make sure that that um, comes forward in the discussions around access to treatments. Um, we have more questions around the webinar. So I'll be sure to make that clear to everyone as well. Um, and I think that is it for the moment. So I guess I will take the opportunity then to thank everyone um, for joining us for this mm -hmm. quite long um, webinar. I'd mm -hmm. like to particularly thank um, the panelists who um, have given such clear um, yet in-depth presentations about what we plan to do in the next two years. It's not obvious um, to uh, present to you um, the ambitious goals of the project and certainly a quite new technique in doing so, but hopefully this has been a successful first attempt and it's for that reason that we scheduled two webinars to get all of that um, communicated to you before we actually start doing any work in smaller groups. Um, uh, I would also like to thank all of the uh, partners, um, which I briefly mentioned in my int in my introduction, but um, just to name them by name as well, we have Lucia Monaco and Silvia Pozzi from the Fondazione Teleton Italia. Um, we have Franco Sassi and Charlotte Brinton from ICL, the Imperial College of London. Uh, Maurizio Scarpa from the um, Metabolic Disease, Rare Disease Reference Network, Luca San Giorgi and Jean-Michel Erd from the um, Rare Bone Disease Network, um, Anna Rath, of course, Charlotte Rodwell and Florence Simon from Orphanet, um, uh, Victoria Headley, Vicky, thank you, and uh, Volker Straub from Newcastle, and last but not least, our new lovely colleagues from Isinova, Giovanna Giuffre, Svetlana Ivanova, and um, and their colleague, um, Mr. Ricci, who will uh, be overviewing the process um, mm -hmm. in, in these methods. So thank you everyone for um, joining this unique opportunity that you are certainly, I know I'm personally privileged to help coordinate, um, and I think I can speak on behalf of all of our partners that we're extremely excited about um, uh, putting together in the next few years. So today you've heard in a lot of detail about a very first step um, in this project, which is drawing this knowledge base together and starting to consider all of the trends um, and drivers. It certainly might seem like a long process, um, but I think you will agree that it's a much needed exercise um, after a decade of great successes to really um, as was mentioned a few times, put press the pause button and consider where are we now? What have we done well? Um, what is coming in the future? And, and to really be better prepared perhaps um, to anticipate opportunities and obstacles in, in policymaking for people with rare diseases. So um, I look forward to seeing all of you on the 29th. Um, I certainly look forward um, to having Vicky um, do an enormous amount of work in the coming months in our virtual um, consultations around 
um, your activities as a panel of experts. And um, if you have not marked the date in your calendars, I really look forward to seeing you all in person on the 7th of November. I know it seems like it's far away, but I think it'll be here before we know it um, to convene and to um, make sure that we're on the right track in providing these recommendations to uh, European and national level policymakers. So thank you all. If there are any questions that weren't answered, I will be sure to come back to you individually. Um, and yes, also, if you need more information um, or would like to circulate this information with any of your contacts, this um, webinar has been recorded. So please feel, we'll, we'll share the link and please feel free to circulate that uh, as well. Um, and please also um, take the time to visit the website, rare2030.eu and our Twitter account, which will keep you now that we've actually started activity much more up to date um, on the activities in the project. So um, thanks again, and I wish all of you a lovely afternoon. Take care. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.